scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, always to, together, the number of names was about 120, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spake before, before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akel Dama, that is, field of, of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let this let his dwelling place be so desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must, be, must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed too, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Good morning, brethren and friends. We're certainly grateful for the opportunity that we have on this day to assemble together and to worship our Heavenly Father this morning. In the last hour, we were here together for Bible class, and now we're grateful for this opportunity and this hour as we worship together. We're thankful to all who have led us in our worship up to this point, thankful to all who taught in our Bible classes uh, in the last hour, and we're thankful to all of you who are here uh, we have been looking forward to this day for uh, many weeks now. We, as the Lord's saints, always look forward to the first day of the week. But this day is a little extra special, I suppose, in that we have a lot of guests with us, visiting with us today. Some just visiting, but many who are the family members of our college students. And we thank you for coming our way and being with us uh, today, allowing us this opportunity to get to know you. We're grateful to have uh, your children, your grandchildren in this area and worshiping with us. We're grateful to our college ministers and their wives and the college students who have been here for a few years and uh, working together with those who are new to UNA or one of the other universities and to this area. And we're just grateful for the time that we have to, to assemble together and work together here at this place and worship together it's to seek to glorify God. We're looking forward to our fellowship meal following or worship this morning. We're looking forward to this evening when the young ladies will lead the ladies at 4 p.m. in the annex. And then the young men will lead our worship in here at 5 p.m. So an exciting day. A lot going on today. Our study will be in the book of Acts chapter 1. If you want to leave your Bible open there, we will not leave Acts chapter 1. I'll probably reference other scripture at least once. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 50. But we will not leave Acts chapter 1 if you would like to go ahead and leave your Bible open there as we talk about filling the void. Grateful to Charlie and reading our text, but I want to go back and begin in verse 9. This was the text that I submitted. This is where the bulk of our study will come from, verses 15 through 26. But I want us to go back to verse 9 as by way of introduction to our study today. Remember the book of Acts written by Luke, the same one who wrote the book of Luke, picks up where the Gospels leave off. Uh, you have the Gospels with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and then ultimately his ascension into heaven. And that is where Luke picks up, if you notice the first eight verses, Jesus, after the death, burial, and resurrection, speaking to his apostles, giving them final instructions. And then you notice in verses 9 through 11 is where he ascends into heaven. 
Picking up in verse 9, when Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, this one who was crucified for you, he is the one that he is going to return, and you will see him. You'll see him come in like manner, just as you saw him go into heaven. So you have the ascension of Jesus. Now I want you to think for a moment, those of you who are members here at Wood Avenue, you've heard me say this before, that when you read the Bible, try to, try to place yourself there. Try to stop, if you can, get in a quiet place and just place yourself there. What, what would it have been like over the last uh, five or six weeks? You have 50 days, of course, from resurrection to Pentecost, 40 days when Jesus ascends into heaven. So over the last few weeks, what would it have been like to be one of these men, one of these apostles? You know, everything that happened, the betrayal, the crucifixion, the resurrection. And now you're, you're receiving some of these final instructions and you see Jesus taken away from you, lifted up into the heavens, the ascension back to God in heaven. Imagine what it would have been like during that time. So they're gazing up into heaven. They're looking up and these two men in white apparel, these two angels say, well, why are you doing this? He's, he's going to come back. And then you notice in verses 12 through 14, as we continue to read the scripture, we see that they do what they were instructed to do, beginning in verse 12. Then they return to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. While I read these names, count to yourself. Peter, James, John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. Circle back around to that a little later. In verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So there you have your text leading up to what's going on. They go back to Jerusalem as they were instructed. And here they are. Peter, the leader of the group, he takes charge as he always does, verses 15 through 20. And he reminds them of Judas, the betrayer. The, 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 the one who led Jesus to his crucifixion, ultimately, that uh, he's no longer. And uh, he has to be replaced. And then you see in the next few verses that Matthias is the one who was chosen. Verses 21 through 26 when we get to that point. So what we have here is, is this, this coming together and discussing what has to happen. And you'll see that Matthias was the one who was going to fill the void. Now I want you to think with me as we get into Judas. I want you to think with me for a moment. Life is ever changing, is it not? Life, life is always changing. There's always something new. There's always something changing. The, the, the old is going out. The new is coming in. You think about the workforce, for example. There are those who... They've put in their years and now they're at the retirement point. But then they're being replaced with the younger generation who's coming in and beginning uh, their careers, whatever it might be. We have a special day today as we've welcomed in the families of our college students. And you think about how there's so much change throughout the school years and then throughout college and attending university, all of the changes. We have some seniors who they're in their final days. And then it'll be time for the next stage. Maybe, maybe beginning a career. Maybe uh, off to grad school. Uh, whatever it might be. Maybe remaining here locally in Florence. Many of our members did just that. Perhaps it is going to another area, another state, or even another country. And then we have our freshmen who are coming in. They're in their first semester of their first year and, and everything is new. Maybe your feet are a little settled by this point, a couple of months into it. But especially if you think back to August, everything was new. Perhaps 
you know, for the first time, uh, you had to, on your own, decide if you were going to church or not on Sunday and Wednesday. And, and then you started trying to fit in on campus. And well, is the CSC important? Do I, do I want to do that? Do I want to go there uh, uh, in all of the events that they host and the retreats? Is this, is this what I want to be a part of my life? For others, as you're getting ready to graduate, you look back and you think, what am I going to do now? This has been life for the last few years. This, this has been my life. I, I'm going to have to now figure out what to do. So there's that, there's that constant change that we're going through. Let me say this, how important it is to always prepare. Because really, we don't know what's coming up. We don't know what is next. You know, you, you probably have plans and things that you want to do, but you don't always know what is next, uh, whether, it, uh, whether it's at work, school, or whatever it might be. And certainly that is the case when it comes to the church. Qu quite often, you, you just don't know what's going on. And, and if you were to look back on life, you think, how did I get here? How did I get to this point? But you're just always trying to prepare and let God use you in the way that he is going to use you currently. And always prepare for what perhaps is coming up and what is next. You think about Matthias as we're going to study uh, throughout this morning. You know, did he know that a point would come when it, he was the next man up to fill the void that was left by Judas? So we're, we're always preparing for what is next. And one of, the, one of the, the, the great things in the church and being members of the Lord's church and letting God use you is, is again, it's, it's just that, letting him use you. There was a preacher who I think was who came from this area I know Basil Overton and Charles Coyle, Coyle came from this area and I think it was one of these two who said I love what I'm doing because I never know what I'm doing you know the point is that you know that you can make plans or whatever but God has his own plans and and and, and things are God's working through you and again that is especially true in the church and you think about the beauty of being a servant in the church. You think about the beauty of being a worker in the church. What you're doing is for the benefit of other people. Ultimately, you're doing it because you want to obey God and you want to be faithful and you want to go to heaven. But when we come together to worship, yes, we are worshiping God, but we're also encouraging one another in our fellowship. When we're working in the church and whatever it might be, ultimately what you're doing as a servant is to help other people. You think about people in the Bible who God used them to fill the void. You think about Seth, for example. And he brought joy to a family who was suffering after the death of Abel. You think about Young Samuel, a man full of integrity, and how he filled the void of the immoral offspring of Eli. You think about King David, a man who had plenty of problems. This is true, plenty of mistakes, but he was a man after God's own heart, and he was always trying to do what was right, and he was always repenting. Whereas he's taken the place of King Saul that was on that downward spiral, and, and, you, and he was one that, that was not trying to do what was right. Well, you find Matthias filling the void of Judas. When you think about the Apostle Judas in Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, you know, he will forever be known as the one who betrayed Jesus. Forever. That, that, that's how Judas of Iscariot will forever be known. Did you notice the scripture reading when Charlie read it for us just a moment ago? He was a guide to those who arrested Jesus. That's how he will forever be known. The guide to those who arrested our Lord. He will forever be known as the betrayer. Probably most of everything you've heard about him is true, but quite often we, we don't always give the complete biblical account of Judas Iscariot. I mean, you think about him. He was a disciple of our Lord for three years. He was handpicked by Jesus to be an apostle. When he was betraying Jesus in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 50, Jesus called him his friend. 
He was a friend of our Lord. And he was trusted by his fellow apostles to be the treasurer. He kept the money. So there's a lot about Judas that we don't consider usually when studying in the life of Judas. We focus in on the one who guided people to arrest Jesus. That's how he'll forever be remembered. You know, some people, it seems as if they can never be replaced. They do great things, whatever it might be, and they, it just seems like there's no way we can ever replace this person. We, maybe, maybe he'll live forever. Maybe she'll live forever. Maybe never move on, never retire. And other people, the thought might be, well, maybe not so much. But let me remind you of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul gives us a description of the church as the body. And he talks about those weaker members, those ones that, that we sometimes think that perhaps they're not important. Oh, but they really are. So let's never forget that. Notice next the Apostle Matthias. Consider the Apostle Matthias. Now, everything we know about Matthias, we know from this scripture text, 21 through 26 of Acts chapter 1. That's everything we know about Matthias. He was not one of the original 12 who was selected by Jesus, but he is the one to fill the void. He is the one to take the place of Judas, and this is what we know. But there's, there's a lot that we can learn about him from our text. If you open your Bible or you keep it open to Acts chapter 1, we notice beginning in verses 21 and 22. Therefore of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Notice verse 22. Beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was taken up from us. One of these must become witness with us of his resurrection. We know that Matthias was a disciple of Jesus. We know that he is one who had followed the Lord for some three years from the baptism of John, from the beginning of our Lord's ministry, until the crucifixion, until the resurrection. So we know that about him. He was a disciple. We know as we continue to read that Jesus selected him as the next apostle. We know that here was a man who remained faithful to God. Let's go back and insert ourselves into the biblical text. You're less than two months since the crucifixion. Five or six weeks. And yet he has remained faithful. Do you remember in John chapter 19 that the apostles were meeting in the upper room for fear of the Jews? These Jews very well could have said, let's just kill them all now. Let's stop it all. We, 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 we've cut off the head, so to speak. We've crucified him. Let's just go ahead and wipe out the rest of them and be done with this movement. And he remained faithful to God. That's something that can be said about Matthias. He remained faithful during difficult days, during difficult times. We see that this man, Matthias, in verse 23, he gained the respect of the other apostles. In verse 23, they proposed to Joseph and, of course, Matthias. So, so, so he gained their respect. And we notice also, as we read earlier, there were about 120 disciples gathered together. Some of them were women, as we know, Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. But we see out of all of these disciples, only two were qualified. Only two were qualified to serve as apostles. That's one of your proof texts, by the way, that there are no apostles today. When you look at the qualifications. If someone ever tries to tell you that they have apostles in their church. Acts chapter 1 says, no, they do not. But we see this man, Matthias. We see next, verse 24, the importance of prayer. We're learning about the life of Matthias. We see that he was qualified. We see that he gained the respect of the other apostles. We see that he lived a life that they turned it over to prayer. In verse 24, they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. You need to always, again, you don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. But we need to always be active, be ready, be willing, the Lord to use us in whatever way. And always be praying about it. That, 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 that God will use your life for good. And we as a church need to always pray. Pray that, that, that there will be those that, that will rise up and lead Wood Avenue in years to come. 
uh, faithful teachers, faithful servants, faithful ministers, faithful deacons, faithful elders. We need to always pray about that. And we need to see and notice in verses 25 and 26 that it was the Lord who selected this man, Matthias. We need to always leave it to the Lord. We need to always go to a thus saith the Lord for everything that we do. But I want you to think with me for a moment as we're talking about Matthias. What would it have been like? Here we go. Let's, let's inter, insert ourselves to the text again. Suppose you're Matthias. You're the one who has been selected, first of all, by the apostles, you and one other, but then ultimately Jesus selected you. You're the one to take the place of the betrayer. You're the one that was selected to take the place of the one who is a guide to those who arrested Jesus. What would it have been like to be Matthias? What would it have been like? Maybe, maybe he reasoned within himself, well, will, I, will I be accepted? I mean, look what Judas did. Will, will, they, will they trust me? You can only imagine all of the questions that were running around in his head. And, and, and I've mentioned before, perhaps some of the challenges that the apostles and early church saw on the day of Pentecost forward. You know, if I'm an unbeliever, and I don't believe that Jesus really is the Christ... I think my argument against the apostles would be, wasn't it one of your own that Jesus handpicked, that betrayed him, that led to his crucifixion? I think that would be the main argument. If I'm, again, if I'm an unbeliever, that, that's what I'm... And so if here you are Matthias, just, you know, I'm not trying to speak where the Bible doesn't speak, but just think about what it would have been like. Oh, I'm the one who is taking the place of Judas the betrayer. The challenges that could be there. Do not ever defeat yourself. If you defeat yourself, then, then, then you, can't, you can't move forward to be victorious. Quite often, we're not able to do what God knows we can do because we defeat ourselves. Discouragement is one of the devil's greatest tools. And when you get discouraged, when you defeat yourself, and when you say, I can't, or I won't, or I'm not qualified, then you've taken your place out of the work that God knows you can do. What if Matthias would have reasoned within himself that, you know what? I think the other guy is better. I, I think Joseph can do this job better than I can. So you, I, I'm going to step out of the way and I'm going to let, I'm going to give it to Joseph. You know, in whatever work that you're doing, there, there's probably someone who can do the job better in some way. That's just the way it is. But whatever you're doing right now, you're doing it. So don't worry about what anyone else would do. Don't, don't worry about how someone else would do the work. And especially what we're talking about in the church, don't worry about it. Maybe learn from them and pick, pick up you know, by example and, and, and seek advice. But you're the one who's in the place to do it right now. Whatever your hand finds to do it, do it with all your might. Song leading, teaching, praying, preaching, visiting, door knocking, uh, helping out with the building, whatever it might be. You're the one in the position you are in currently, so do it to the best of your ability. Again, what if, what if Matthias would have said, oh, I'm going to bow out. I'm going to let somebody else do this. I read an article, uh, newsletter just a few days ago from a missionary to the Pacific Islands. And he told this story that was really interesting and it fits in well here. Uh, some 50 years ago or so, they were, he and his wife, living in uh, Samoa in the Pacific Islands. And he told the story of about a, a man that he converted to Christ and this man started preaching and teaching lessons when he could. And They started a radio work and 
the, the American brother wanted this local to start preaching on the radio. Said the first two times he got so sick that he could not even preach. He couldn't do it. What if he would have said, I, I can't do this. This is not for me. You know, just give, I've tried it once, I've tried it twice, I, I, I just can't do it. But he didn't do it. He kept on by, by the third time, third time's a charm, right? And he, and he started preaching on the radio. And he preached on the radio for two years. And as far as they know, in radio work, you really don't know who all of you're affecting. But as far as they know, no one was ever converted except his wife. They studied with her a number of times and she never would become a Christian. But hearing him go over these sermons at home as he's practicing his sermons and then hearing them on the radio, she eventually became a Christian. What if this man had said, I can't do it. I just look at, I'm getting physically sick. I'm just, I'm done. But Steve said, no, I'm going to do this. And eventually he converts his wife. Fast forward some 50 years, these two eventually moved to New Zealand Started the Lord's church, faithful members of it today, with about 75 members in the congregation where they worship. What if this man would have said, you know what, I'm not the best. He, he, he probably was, will never be the best radio preacher, or the best pulpit preacher or whatever, but none of us are. None of us are. We're just doing the best we can do at this point in life. We we'll always want to do that. But consider the apostles and the disciples. When you think about the apostles and the disciples in our text, you think about what they did to help Matthias become a working member in this apostleship. Number one in verse 17, as you see, they did not compare him to Judas. Peter says, you know, Judas was numbered among, he was, he was an apostle. He was right there with them until the end. What if, it would have been wrong for them to say, you know what? Oh, we, we're going to keep our eye on the new guy. What if he does to us what Judas did to Jesus? That wasn't what they did. They, they, did, not, they did not compare him to Judas in that way. They did not uh, immediately find fault in him for something that someone else has done. Quite often we'll do that if we're not careful. I had to raise funds for a decade to travel overseas and preach the gospel. I don't know how many times I've sat before elderships and they say, you know what, we tried that and it didn't work, so we, we're, we're done supporting mission work. So I'm suffering because of the decisions of another person. Or, or young men wanting to go to preaching school. Well, we did that once and the guy didn't do what he said he was going to do, so we're done with that. The devil's winning, is he not? Well, we'll just keep it all in the bank account and build that. I don't know how many times I've heard elderships say, our next preacher... You know what, let me tell you what he's going to do. And they're basing it on what the current preacher is not doing. And I thought, well, instead of stepping up and leading and shepherding in the way that you should, you're just going to take it out on the next guy. All too often, we interact with people and we treat people not in, in, in ways that is not fair, but rather in ways and actions of other people. They fellowshiped, as you notice in verses 14 and 15. Quite often, we hinder the work of the church and those who are ready to step up and step in because we simply do not know one another. They were in fellowship with one another. And notice in verse 23, they selected the only two men who were qualified. They did not use the buddy system. What if there was another disciple out there who was a faithful disciple but not qualified to serve as an apostle and they say, you know what, he's not really qualified in all the areas and all the ways but I've known him for so long and you know, look, look at everything that we've been through together. Let's just go ahead and put his name in there too. That wasn't the case. They left it only to those who were qualified. They prayed about it. Show their dependence on God and praying about it. And then they worked together, verses 25 and 26. Well, let's conclude this morning and what you can do to prepare to fill the void. Again, life is ever changing. New are coming in, old are going out, moving away, whatever it might be. Always prepare. Look back on your life and to where it is now and say, I never imagined the Lord would bring me to this point. What's next? 
Always prepare. Pray for opportunities, but also look for opportunities. Quite often they are there, but we're not looking for them. Pray for them and look for them. Ask the leadership of the church, what is needed currently? Do we need teachers? Do we need people to invite others to church? Do, are there members here who need, do, they need a ride to church? Meals on Wheels? Song leaders? What are, what are the current needs that maybe I can step in and help with? Seek out mentors. Seek out those who will help to train you in the areas perhaps that you want to be involved. Realize that you're going to fail. We all do. But don't let failure stop you. Learn from it and continue on. Quite often, we don't fill the void because we think it's bigger than what it really is. No, it's baby steps. It's the little things in life that you do over and over and over make a big difference. Believe in the power of God to do great things in your life. So for, to all of us, Let's continually do anything that we can to be like Matthias and say, all right, it's my turn. Let's go to work. If you're ready to go to work this morning, we're ready to help you to do that. Cannot work in the Lord's kingdom if you're not in the Lord's kingdom. Are you a believer that Jesus Christ died for your sins, rose again on the third day? Are you ready to put that belief to practice as you repent of your sins, to change from life of sin and whatever it might be? Come and acknowledge before others, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. And to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins so you can be buried and have them washed away, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, to rise and walk in the newness of life. Or to return and become faithful once again. So I'm ready for the Lord to use me, but I need to become faithful as a baptized believer. I'm repenting and praying to God for forgiveness. If there's anything that we can do to help you to go to heaven, please let us do it. You can let it be known now as we stand and as we sing.